Welcome to this webinar, everyone. My name is Esther Miriam Wagner. I'm the Executive Director of the Wolf Institute and the Editor-in-Chief of Alma Sark, uh, which is the Journal of the Society for the Medieval Mediterranean. And uh, I hope this is the first of, of many collaborations between the Wolf Institute and the Society for the Medieval Mediterranean uh, in organizing webinars. For those of you who don't know the Wolf Institute, we are a research institution that focuses on religion and society, and we combine research with public education, policy work, uh, and other outreach activities. Most of our research is concerned with contemporary social sciences projects, but we also understand the importance of uh, approaching all topics from a historical perspective, and therefore we have uh, quite a few of our students and affiliated researchers uh, work on historical themes. And today uh, we're doing this webinar together with the Society for the Medieval Mediterranean, uh, the society is dedicated to all aspects of the academic study of the, medieval, uh, of the Mediterranean, uh, uh, Mediterranean history and culture from the 5th to the 15th centuries. It aims to foster cross-cultural uh, and interdisciplinary investigation and encourage debate on cross-pollination within the medieval Mediterranean. Society also has a journal, as I mentioned already, Almasak, which is an international peer-reviewed journal concerned with fostering innovative cross-cultural and interdisciplinary research of Mediterranean spaces. So we always encourage uh, all, at all our seminars and our conferences uh, uh, submissions to the journal. Um, I think we can probably share a screen later where we show the link. The journal subscription of Almasak is part of our membership of the society. So for those of you who are not members of the society yet, but you're thinking about it, it's really worth it uh, being a member of the society uh, is worth it on its own because we have this really nice uh, biannual conference. Uh, next one is in 2021 in, in Crete. Um, but the membership also comes with subscription of the Alma Sark uh, issues, three issues every year. So I'll quickly explain how this webinar works before I uh, introduce our distinguished panelists. Um, from the names popping up, I see quite a few of us, uh, a few we know, students uh, and colleagues. It's really wonderful to have you all here with us, even if we can't see you. Uh, we see your name and we see that you're there. Um, we're also live streaming on Facebook, so if you want to rewatch this or recommend it to anyone, then it's available from the Wolf Institute Facebook page from tomorrow. So today we want to discuss how medieval people around the Mediterranean communicated across religious and cultural boundaries. Some of the themes we want to explore include how did people negotiate different languages and alphabets? How was knowledge disseminated between communities? What can we learn from multilingual correspondence? And I hope that we'll also be able to explore the synergies between the different topics here. Yeah, it's not so easy because you know, you, we sit in all different rooms, we can all see each other, only see each other, uh, in, in tiny little windows, but we hope we'll make it work in this webinar. And we have with us various members of the society committee um, who work on different time periods and countries around the Mediterranean. Uh, first up is Dr. Christopher Heal. He's uh, from Manchester Metropolitan University and he works on the early medieval Mediterranean with a focus on the Italian peninsula. His uh, main research interests at the moment are violence and theory and practice the dynamics of power in the long 8th century and the historiography of conflict. Uh, we also have with us Dr. Antonella Liuzzo Scorpo. She's from the University of Lincoln. She's very interested in cultural history of medieval Iberia, focusing on both Castile Leon and the Crown of Aragon. And some of her main areas of interest are friendship and in interface relationships, the history of emotions, and political and diplomatic communication, as well as memory and self-representation. And our third panelist is Dr. Jan van der Bury, lecturer in later medieval history at the University of Leicester. His research focuses on cross-cultural interaction and exchange of knowledge in the East and medieval Mediterranean of the 12th and 13th century, in particular travel, pilgrimage, mission, and crusading narratives. So we'll have a little bit of a, uh, each of the speakers will talk for a few minutes about the topic uh, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion among ourselves. So this will last for about 20-25 minutes and then we'll uh, go on to a Q&A uh, for about 25 minutes, 30 minutes. Uh, you can type in your questions in the Q&A portal at the bottom of your screen. Please don't put it in the chat because it's more difficult for us to manage uh, questions from the chat. So please 
uh, any questions put in the Q&A uh, uh, box that is uh, at the bottom uh, of, your, of your screen. So we're starting with our first topic, uh, which are polemics, focusing on contacts between religious communities for the moment. These were often um, not desired by community leaders on all sides, so people were not in terribly interested in collaboration uh, between the different communities. Um, excessive social interaction was seen as a force that weakened the morals of the community and that guided people away from their faiths. So it was very important to keep up boundaries and assert superiority of one's own faith. And one of the most obvious communication channels between medieval religious communities that we, we still can see that are preserved in our historical sources are there for polemics. People where you have the sort of aggressive disputations of peoples of different uh, religions debating their faith with one another. And in this context, elements of, of another religion were often used to legitimate one's own. Um, you've probably read David Nuremberg's work on Spain, where he, he describes this very, very illuminative example of a court case in Talavera after the Christian reconquest, where Muslim and Jews, Jewish representatives deploy Christian stereotypes and prejudices against one another in order to prove whether Muslims or Jews are, are closer to Christ. So Jan, you have worked on a similar topics in the in, in, in the context of the Fifth Crusade, right? And you also want to talk a little bit about um, multilingualism in that context. Yes. Well, thank you, Miriam, for the introduction, and, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, yes, indeed, the, the Crusades and, and the Crusader states, as they were called um, in the 12th and 13th century, are, I guess, very obvious examples of this. Um, as you said, aggressive polemics between different groups of religions and, and different ethnicities and backgrounds. Um, and I want to talk a bit more sort of in, in general about um, the, uh, the, the, the situation in these, in the Latin East, as they call it, in the Eastern Mediterranean between different cultures, how they interact cross-culturally and cross-religiously. Religiously. Um, by focusing on this aspect of language and specifically the language, uh, polemical language. Um, I want to start with a little quote and to, to contextualize this quote, we are in the sort of early 12th century in the 1120s. Um, the chaplain of the King of Jerusalem is writing about the Crusades and about the recent crusading events so the franks as they call them the the crusading force um has managed miraculously to um take jerusalem and to establish a um sort of feudal kingdom a european modeled um society in the middle east in back then palestine and um, syria um where they are just the top layer of the society they are not really um, a, a all-encompassing settled um, group. So anyway, in 1120s, around 1124, um, this French author called Fulcher of Chartres is writing um, about the situation at that time in the lands, and it's a quote that's been used quite a lot in in teaching, in scholarship about the Crusades, and some of you that have seen the list will will know this quote very well. Um, but let's get to the words first of Fulker. So he writes, um, and I'll just select a few lines. He writes that, for we who were Occidentals have now become Orientals. He who was a Roman or a Frank has in this land been made into a Galilean or a Palestinian. We have already forgotten the places of our birth. Already these are unknown to many of us or not mentioned anymore. And this goes on a bit, but the part I'm really interested in is the next lines where he says, people use the eloquence and idioms of diff diverse languages in conversing back and forth. Words of different languages have become common property known to each nationality. And mutual faith unites those who are ignorant of their descent. This line has been, has been used quite often by scholars um, to... to emphasize the, the kind of multilingual sometimes or multicultural aspect of that society. But it's necessary to kind of contextualize this a bit more perhaps. Um, 
first of all, uh, what Fulker is writing about is the Western imported kind of groups. Um, he does not mean that they have adopted a mutual language with the local native Arabic speaking, mostly population. Um, what he is talking about is in fact what has become a very famous idiom, um, the so-called lingua franca. So uh, what is now used as sort of a, um, a way to say this is a common language between people originates in this context. Uh, these people, the, the crusaders and their descendants were called the Franks and lingua franca, so from the Latin of you know, the language of the Franks, was meant to be a exactly what he describes a mix of uh, italian french and a little bit of very brief arabic or greek words that they picked up into a common language that could be used by most of the western inhabitants um, over there what he does not talk about as i said before is is the the way they communicate with the native people the native either eastern christians who would be speaking Arabic as well, or the native Muslim population. Um, the second thing to, think, to keep in mind is that Fulker at that time was, was writing for specific reasons. We talked about polemics, and he, is, he has a very certain agenda. He wants to depict the life in the kingdom at that point as a very idyllic, um, idealized, nice kind of situation, while that certainly wasn't the case, and they were trying to get more people from Europe to come over to um, to the east to to up their numbers. Um, now the point about multilingualism is interesting, and we'll mention this a few times, I think, in this in this conversation. Multilingualism, as we see it, um, should not and cannot, in most cases, be used in this context because multilingualism is something we we understand today in today's context as somebody who can speak several languages proficiently, fairly proficiently at the same time. We are educated, we have rich education. Back then in the Middle Ages at least, that would not be the case. People who were multilingual were only a very small fraction of society and they were the highest educated religious elite usually and they would um, only know a few languages. They would know a vernacular, they would know Latin, and they would know Greek, perhaps, um, at least in a, in a Western context. Um, on the other hand, we can speak about the idea of plurilingualism, where uh, the difference is that plurilingualism means that people are more um, accepting towards other languages, and they are willing to adopt parts from other languages in their own or willing to try to understand them and they are tolerant towards other languages in their environment so that's a very big difference to make um, the other point to make is that and we'll talk about this a bit more in due time as well um, is the idea of uh, deglossia so the idea that people would speak or use two languages or two dialects at least in many cases um, and in this situation, that would mostly be for liturgical and scriptural uh, purposes. So, for instance, the Syriac Christians living in um, the Middle East would be speaking Arabic on a daily basis, but would be using Greek for their religious um, practices. Um, obviously, the the Latin Latin clergy would be using um, the vernacular, maybe the French on a daily basis, but then you would use Latin um, in their liturgical practices. Um, and we'll talk a bit more later about sort of the, the communication with different groups. This is where the Fifth Crusade uh, little story comes in that I'll talk about later. Um, to, to think of the idea of how they communicated between different groups. I think I'm going over my three minutes now, so um, I'll leave it up to to. Antonella to, to take over. Thank you very much, Jan. A little bit over time, but that's fine. Uh, we're moving on to uh, diplomacy. So we've, we've, we've covered a bit of um, uh, polemics and, uh, uh, and sort of the crusader context. We're moving on to Spain now. 
Uh, Antonella, you work on um, dipl diplomatic uh, communication more on the West, so perhaps talk a little bit about that. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you Miriam for organizing this first webinar sponsored for, um, by the Society for the Medieval Mediterranean. So in the next four minutes, I'm actually going to provide a little bit of background before digging and delving into diplomacy as such. Um, and then obviously mention some aspects that we can discuss uh, later. And I'll start where basically where Jan interrupted um, thinking about the plurilingualism and within that uh, whether we can talk about multilingualism, situations of diaglossia that characterized uh, 13th century Iberia. And the 13th century in particular is a significant uh, point in time because it's when we see the emergence of a more systematic use of the vernaculars in law, administration and obviously literature, witnessing therefore the development of a kind of broader uh, uh, development of lay literacy more broadly. Um, but within that, I'm going to focus on the plurilingualism of multilingualism that we see within uh, each territorial and political unity. And in particular, I'm going to use the case study of the Kingdom of Aragon under the reign of James I, so from 1213 to 1276. And just to give you a very, very brief overview, what we are talking about is a range of languages that are used both in oral and written form. When you think about the languages of the territories that James I inherited, so is Aragonese and Catalan and Occitan, and then you think about the languages of the new territories that he conquered, so Valencia, Mallorca, and the Arabic that obviously um, some of those communities spoke, and then there is the Latin of the chancery records that continue to be present, despite the fact that from the 1240s, more or less, we see more and more documents produced also in the vernacular, and then there's Hebrew and um, Judeo, um, and Aragonese or Judeo Romance, and obviously the importance there also of uh, Jewish um, mediators, cultural mediators, um, especially also in uh, diplomatic uh, uh, negotiations, as we will talk about later. So I think that it's important really to cross reference, uh, first of all, different type of sources, um, which is essential to shed light on both the pragmatic but also symbolic adoption of uh, these linguistic varieties, both oral and written, but also of different registers, especially across and beyond geopolitical, religious, um, and ethnic frontiers. So thinking about text is um, extremely important and thinking about translation. And when I talk about translation, what I'm referring to on the one hand is the uh, transmission, reshaping, adaptation of ideas, concepts, literally from a language to another and across languages and therefore across uh, communities in time and space. But I would like to also think about a little bit more how and to what extent we can get a glimpse of uh, some of the oral tradition, customs and practices through the surviving written records. And I'm going to use some examples later on to um, explain that. So if we take this as a framework of, and the case study I want to talk about a little bit more, um, within that, uh, I would like to focus on communication, talking about uh, this as a multi-layered dynamic that involves obviously language, but also uh, a symbolism associated with gestures, rituals, practices and performance um, that all help to build legitimacy around uh, pragmatic reciprocal uh, recognition. And this is particularly evident when we start examining the communication strategies adopted by medieval rulers to manage their political and diplomatic exchanges. And within that, and here it comes finally, the language and rhetoric of emotions. And within that, I think the language of friendship, we can have a separate webinar on friendship if you like, uh, played a very key uh, role as a cross-cultural means of communication as well as of legitimization and validation. So languages really should be examined in a broader and whether possible in a less uh, disciplinary compartmentalized framework. In other words, thinking about the linguistic variants but also the different uses and the breaking in some cases of some of the customary norms and standards to enhance our understanding of these complex and multi-layered dynamics and how these were adopted to pursue either or both um, pragmatic and symbolic agendas. So all these considerations, I think, should help us to reflect upon changes and continuity in modes of communication, in diplomatic operations, and in shaping of political thinking in which language and within it, 
the language of emotions and the performance of emotions um, were, as uh, still are, I would say, central to promoting, explaining and legitimizing different types of connections and exchanges. Looking forward to talk a little bit more about all these. Thank you very much, Antonella. Um, our last speaker is uh, Christopher Heath. Um, and you focus a little bit more on individuals. You focus on, 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 on case studies of individuals, which showcase very nice cross-cultural uh, contacts. Yes, yeah, so uh, hello everybody. Great to see you. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you for arranging this. All the technology is beyond me. Uh, I'm going to take us back to the seventh century uh, and I'm going to present a little vignette. So I'm going to be a bit, uh, I'm going to cheat because I'm going to look at my script and I'm probably going to waste, use more than four minutes. So please bear with me. Here we go. Uh, Perpetrate was the king of the Lombards in Italy in the late 7th century. Unusually, indeed uniquely for the Lombard regnum, he shared kingship with his brother until they were both supplanted by Grimoald, the erstwhile ducks of Benevento. This propelled Perpetuit into exile with the pagan Avars, whose polity abutted the Lombard kingdom in the east. In the early Middle Ages, uh, those rulers who were replaced or overthrown were a problem. What should be done to them? The options might be characterised as external exile, internal exile, private murder, public murder or death, and finally disfigurement. It was not expected or envisaged um, that an individual once replaced would come back. Exceptions tend to prove the rule. Um, Perpetrate, however, was able to not, not only return, but to also rule and cement his kingship across three generations and presumably die in his own bed. This success was facilitated by the actions of the Avars to whom he fled in 662. According to our main narrative source for this period in Italy, uh, Grimoire was not content to allow Perpetua to safe and gilded exile at the court of the Avar Kagan. Instead, he sent an ambassador to demand that Perpetua might must be given up or he would wage war against them. The Kagan allowed Perpetua to go uh, in what direction he would, uh, and surprisingly perhaps, Perpetua decided to return to Italy, and having sent a message onwards to Grimoire, was assured that he would be safe. Paul the Deacon tells us that Grimoire declared, and I quote, you will suffer nothing evil in any way. Subsequently, when it became apparent that Patrick was still popular in uh, Pavia, uh, Grimoire changed his mind and attended to do uh, Patrick to death. Now, you'll be delighted to know that the details of this need not concern us here. Uh, Paul's comments are, however, interesting. In concluding the section on the escape of Perjurit, he says, thus, I quote, God Almighty, by his merciful arrangement, delivered an innocent man from death and kept from offence a king who desired in his heart to do good. I shall return to this contrast in a moment, but I just want to talk about the fluidity of communication in the early Middle Ages to set some context uh, to what we're talking about this evening. Uh, now, the early Middle Ages were, to use the phrase of Wickham, centuries of development and experiment. And in terms of communication, this period saw the splicing of old linguistic contexts and the creation of new idioms. Now, now a lengthy consideration uh, of this, that can, we can wait till we have a discussion in a bit. Uh, we'll be talking, no, no doubt, about Syriac, Greek and Arabic and so on and so forth. But it's too soon at this stage to talk about um, a singular language, certainly to, too soon to speak of Italian. Um, on balance, uh, communication in communication terms, the Lombards and the Avars should, you would expect, have had difficulties in understanding each other in, uh, directly. Uh, but also, and this is where, this is where I um, would like to um, um, emphasise for my contribution, there should be difficulties in what I would call socio-cultural empathy and in understanding, quite crucially, each other's rules of political engagement. So if we return to portraits at the Avar court, usually with narrative sources of the early Middle Ages, there is no evident corroboration from other materials. Indeed, this episode is the direct proof against the old view that Paul the Deacon's reliability is, quote, suspect. Were there to be no other further notice of these events, one would find the episode described as entirely unremarkable. May another example of a once upon a time king rendered into an exile anxious to avoid a violent demise. But we are furnished with an anecdote in the life of St. Wilfrid, composed in the early 720s, which contains a report of Wilfrid's visit to, yes, Perk to its court on his way to Rome. 
A Pope trip, we are told, I received messages from Britain who would urge the king to prevent Wilfrid from traveling onwards. But the king refused on the basis that when he had been, quote, dwelling with a certain pagan king of the Huns, that, quote, a covenant with the idol that was his god had saved Pope from evil treatment, notwithstanding the offer of a full bushel of gold. Thus, Pope promised that how much more shall I, who know the true God, refuse to give my soul over to destruction for the wealth of the whole world? Now, this inversion of cultural expectation is interesting, or it is to me at least. For Byzantine commentators, Avars have been called a quote, an ugly nation of hairy barbarians. And Theophylax Simacata, for instance, portrayed them as savage, faithless, cruel, and perfidious, their rulers arrogant and greedy. Yet in this short notice, we see that the Avars could adopt standards and approaches that soften their apparent alterity. Thus, in this way, they negotiate different codes and languages and cross the constructive barriers of civilization and barbarity. So to conclude, I'd like to, to very briefly highlight three factors. One, the multifocality of early medieval society smoothed over issues of linguistic unintelligibility or at least the silence of narrative sources implies that that was the case. Two, commentators such as Paul the Deacon, whilst not silent about identity and ethnicity, do not provide commentary on the mechanics of communication and confusions that could arise. But setting out the notice as he does, there is an evident socio-political bridge between the Lombards and the Avars. Three, socio-cultural differences and religious variants allow commentators to draw distinctions between groups X and Y and to ascribe expected behaviours. When these are not followed or are inverted, as they are in the story of Perpetuate, we exit explicit lessons provided to the reader. Here then we see pagans keep their word and honour and Christians break their oaths and undermine their cumulitas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, there was a, a slight issue with the muting. Yeah. Um, we have the first questions coming in. So I would encourage you now everyone to, to, to write out any questions they have for our panelists. Um, but while you're all typing and thinking, uh, I think we'll chat a little bit among ourselves. Um, again, I work on the Geniza and a lot of the points that our panelists make, made um, you know, come, at, come up in my work as well. So Antonella, when it comes to language of emotions in the correspondence, um, something that I see a lot in, in, in my work is that their languages are consciously used as a, as a, as a means of immediacy. So for example, if, um, if you write to a close friend, you would, as a Judeo Arabic uh, 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 Egyptian, as a Jewish Arabic uh, Egyptian, you would avoid Hebrew, but you would use Arabic as a, as, as a language of endearment. Uh, whereas if you wrote uh, in a more political manner or to someone of a higher social standing, you would increase the Hebrew content in order to um, sound perhaps more educated than you are. Do you have some other examples in, in your work? Um, yes. So I think it's very interesting what you just mentioned, because obviously when it comes to the field of political and diplomatic communication, what we also have to keep in mind is the, what well, are the standards of the chanceries that we are referring to and therefore who you write to, what language you use uh, and whether, and this is what something I mentioned before, what is also interesting and significant is to see whether what we find in the records reflect the actual passage of negotiations and the language of those negotiations. And so in this sense, uh, that's why I also chose the case study of uh, the Kingdom of Aragon under James I, because what we have done with James I is actually uh, when the Chancery uh, the Royal Chancery grows massively. We have a lot of records there, um, especially from the 1240s, more or less, also a lot in vernacular. But what is interesting that is from that period, what we also have is the Chronicle autobiography um, written from the perspective of the same James uh, I. That supposedly he dictated, well, he, I don't think he wrote it himself, but he dictated it in Catalan. Um, and the Yibada Fets or Book of Deeds. And what we know about this text is that the original must have been dictated in Catalan, which is already significant uh, when you think that 
also he's the king of Aragon, and Aragonese is a very different um, language, much more similar, uh, let's say, to Castilian, if you like, compared with the Catalan that has got more kind of Occitan roots, if you like. Um, but what is interesting is that in, so first of all, the big question is the chronicle written in Catalan, has, what is the reason for writing this uh, and dictating this chronicle in Catalan? And I think that actually lies in the reason why he writes this chronicle. Personally, I think that this is because it's mainly a didactic work and therefore it's aimed at his successors. But we can talk about the chronicle and, and the language of the chronicle in a separate moment. But what the chronicle tells us um, is also, obviously what he's doing is military campaigns, but a lot of these negotiations, political and diplomatic negotiations. So what you see there is basically what happens before the actual treaties, pieces, truces that we then find in the records of the Chantry. So for example, there's a chapter in which um, he talks about um, he's uh, moving towards Valencia and so the conquest, well, the surrender of uh, a town called Peniscola in 1225. And what we hear that in the Chronicle um, is that uh, basically the Saracens of, uh, uh, of the city had sent a letter, a, a messenger with a letter to one of his uh, men, and then the letter was somehow forwarded to him. And what happens is because the king is not there, he's in Teruel, he uh, calls or search for uh, someone who could read Arabic so that he could double check that what the messenger was saying coincide with what the letter actually said. And so first of all, there's an important point here. I don't think it's a coincidence that he's saying that he wants someone who can read Arabic. And so here we go back to um, a point that uh, Jan made at the beginning, like what does it mean multilingualism or polylingualism and the co linguistic competence. You can understand Arabic. It doesn't mean you can write um, Arabic. It doesn't mean you can write a charter in Arabic that should be done obviously uh, with uh, the classical Arabic. So we have multiple uh, levels that, that we have to keep in mind. But going back to this episode, which, because it's an interesting one, what also uh, James adds, by the way, so they made a treaty, they made a truce, then there's also the performance of it. So they, they go out of the city, they offer food, lovely food, he mentioned figs and things like that, but anyway, it's nearly dinner time, so that distracts me. Um, but what is interesting is that he also said, oh, by the way, because I had to come here in a rush, I basically left my notaries uh, back. So this reference, so he says, we are basically using this temporary document to understand whatever the agreement is, and then he said that when he goes back, um, uh, he's going to actually ask his notaries to put everything in writing to confirm the rights of the uh, Muslims of, um, of Peniscola, et cetera, et cetera. So, and he says specifically so that the, his notaries can draw up the document for them. So he's referring to the official one. So I think this episode, although it's, it's just one episode and he's narrated obviously uh, within the Chronicle that adds a, a lot uh, more emphasis to it, but it's interesting because it gives us a sense of, first of all, the process of translation from the oral side of things to the written side, but also the different languages and potentially the diglossia that Jan was referring to. So the Arabic that they, they might have been able more or less to understand is not the same Arabic perhaps of the charter, the final official documents that they are uh, then preserving and then obviously translating um, in some cases. And then the Chronicle also gives us references and ideas to, um, um, to um, obviously knights who are able to speak Arabic and therefore they use as negotiators in terms of uh, if, there's, if they're captives to ransom, for example. The Chronicle is also quite funny because James the first switches and then there are parts in Catalan, parts in Castilian, which, okay, fair enough, it happens when he's actually talking about the King of Castile, but he, this is um, a, another aspect perhaps um, to talk about. So um, within that, the language obviously of emotion is present, but it's interesting because sometimes it's present as you would find it in uh, kind of in standard uh, terms or Let's use. Let's think about amicitia. Obviously, that's kind of a standard term that we find uh, recurrently. But what is significant is when you actually break with those standards. And so 
when James I, in one of his um, actually letters from 1260 to the King of Castile, who's also his son-in-law, Alfonso X, uh, basically um, uh, says that he, he will send his uh, vassals to help him um, in the uh, struggle against the Muslims. But then he says, I'm not going to help you against the King of Tunis because he's my ally. But he reassures him by saying, but you are mi mayor amigo, like my best friend. So he's not using just amicizia, that would be standard, it wouldn't add anything. So sometimes it's the breaking of those standards that might tell us something about how that language sometimes is used to confirm an agreement, sometimes it's used, sometimes it's actually used to pass a threat. This is what um, Alfonso X does the other way around, but we can talk about it later. I don't want to monopolize the conversation. Uh. <laughs> what happens in threats? I mean, when you express a threat, do you also see some particular linguistic shift? I mean, in my in my uh, experience from from Geniza materials, threats are usually expressed with uh, a register change. So you will go into very very vernacular language to really bring across the threat. Uh, is that something you see just very quickly? So that's interesting because the, uh, there have been recent uh, recent studies on the Catalan side of things, uh, uh, working on the kind of code switching, and that's exactly what happens. You use the vernacular, whether that's for immediacy or sometimes for sharing a threat. Um, but then sometimes, as in the case I was mentioning before, um, in that very same conversation that is happening, an, an epistolary exchange between James I and, and uh, Alfonso X in 1260, Alfonso is actually used the very same language of friendship, but to pass the threat. So he's basically saying, well, if you are my friend, you should do or not do this, this, and that. Otherwise, these are the results. So it's very interesting because the language is the same, but actually that language provides the safe conduct to put your, well, if not threat in, but to make sure that you basically set the tone of that agreement, if there is an yeah. agreement afterwards or not. Jan, uh, Chris, do you have anything to add to immediacy and threats? Yes, um, the code switching is very interesting because in the early Middle Ages you might, in given contexts, provide a written message, but you would also uh, allow the messenger to provide an oral message which may or may not be a rather more stronger or a threatening message. Of course the difficulty is the evidence in the Middle Ages, we're not we're not blessed with uh, that particularity that, that Antonella um, described. Um, but there's certainly sort of code switching. You can see that definitely. I think um, with these documents that we we have preserved, we have to keep in mind that the message wasn't always towards the instead of a, in the case of a threat, for example, wasn't always um, addressed towards the adversary but often towards their own public their own um, subjects so um, a spanish king or a ruler in 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 the east um, uh, a preacher in my case for example wanted to be seen to say something to an adversarial audience by his own people whether or not that language that message was understood so we get this very weird situation, for example, where we have a preacher like the one I've been working on uh, for a while now, Jacques de Vitry, who was a um, preacher who was um, bishop in the Holy Land in, in the Kingdom of Jerusalem, trying to convert Muslims, trying to also, um, in a way, convert or, or reform Eastern Christians to follow the Catholic ways of Christianity. And but he does not speak the local language, he does not speak Arabic. So in, in all the times he was preaching, he said in his letters, he was preaching to local population, he would say, um, I was preaching by means of interpreters to the Arabic speaking Christians or the Arabic speaking Muslims. And you, and then he says, oh, and, and after I kind of, you know, told them off, um, they converted, they, they changed their ways. And you very much wonder, okay, if he's relying on a local interpreter usually a Syriac Christian because they would have both the Greek and the Arabic and then he could communicate with them in Greek and then he would be able to transmit the message you, you, he doesn't know what the local interpreter has said to the audience <laughs> so his threat may not have been um, understood completely nor the intention of the audience may have been transferred translated back to him completely so but his, his 
mission, mission was accomplished. He could write back to the Pope saying, I have preached to the local population. I have given them my message. And it seems to me that they have changed their ways. So he can, he can portray himself as a successful preacher without ever having uh, delivered the message. Same thing with all the letters we have preserved from, for example, communication supposedly between Frederick II and uh, the, the um, Ayyubid Sultan or uh, the Mongol Khan and then the Pope. These letters are usually preserved within the uh, within the archives, within the, the kind of um, papers of the people who are sending them. So they want to be seen by their people to be sending something to the enemy, a threat, um, an opening up of friendship. But whether that message reaches the enemy is very much the question. And that's often not what matters. I think what matters is what they are seen to be doing. Okay, could I pick up on something you said, you sort of, you talked about earlier, uh, Jan. You were talking about multilingualism being, um, in, uh, where you work, sort of a, 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 um, a, 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 sort of a matter of, of elite um, schooling. Um, of course, I think this is where quite a few areas in the Mediterranean substantially differ. If you move more away towards the east, there are, of course, areas where people are trilingual, speaking Aramaic, speaking Arabic, speaking Kurdish, speaking uh, uh, Persian, um, sort of, you know, on a, on a local level between villages. Um, and we also have a question that relates to this. Some, so Nerea asked, and could we know if there's any difference between the degree of or like the level of medieval people learning and using uh, uh, writing skills and speaking skills. I mean, wow. could we know if they have the same level of speaking and writing skills in a foreign language by sources or archaeology? So perhaps we could sort well, of tie this together. Yeah, I think it's a good question. But what we have to understand is that when we, when we sort of talk about medieval people, writing is out of question in most cases of, of, the Western, of the Western Europe. The, you know, the... the less than one percent far less than one percent of the people could write so it's very difficult to make to make that sort of make that point for the general population what we can say is that people who were educated the, the educated elite the religiously educated people i would assume that most of them if they were proficient in a in a language of speaking and understanding they would also have a sense of reading and writing it the educated ones, but Antonella made a very good point about the idea that, and this is where is plurilingualism is separated from multilingualism. And the first question that came up in the in the Q and A is interesting in that yes. sense. So that's Piali. Piali, you, if you want to read out, I'll read out the question. Piali asked, "Can we use multilingualism and plurilingualism as an interchangeable term? Do we use multilingualism as a personal choice depending upon language, contact, and interaction?" It's a, it's a really good question, and, and the two. I think, at least from my perspective, they, they talk about different things. Multilingualism is the same thing as bilingualism, multilingualism. It's about the level of somebody's knowledge of different languages. If somebody is multilingual, it means that they are proficient in more than two languages. And I think that was, again, aside from the very highly educated elite, quite rare to be happening. But like the example I gave of the, the lingua franca, people who were essentially monoglot, for example, French speaking, but would arrive in a multilingual, in a, in a um, environment where several languages around them are kind of going around, like the Middle East, they would be, they seem to be willing to and tolerate other languages and trying to communicate with them. And in the process, as we've seen in the source, they may adopt a few little words, but that doesn't mean they are multilingual. It, it means that they are, they are trying to find ways to communicate with different languages around them and they have the means to do it. Yes. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's the difference between the two. They can't be used interchangeably. Chris, you wanted to add something? Yes, I wanted to uh, perhaps uh, ask Jan, uh, could he imagine a greengrocer in Jerusalem in the early 12th century uh, who would be indigenous to that area so that Arabic would be the mother tongue. 
but that over time they would de develop a sort of a, a functionality where they could at least uh, try and sell their wares into yeah, in no, of course. languages. You might almost, they might almost develop a sort of form of Creole, if you like, yeah. uh, which introduces into their mother tongue, you know, a, um, a, a pattern of yeah. noun usage, which allows yeah. them to communicate. And that is exactly plurilingualism. That is, that is yeah. um, in his case, the greengrocer has to try and attract clientele. So he wants to yeah. communicate with these people that don't speak his language. Yeah. He wouldn't be multilingual. He wouldn't be no. able to to, to uh, properly speak a full conversation in French, he wouldn't be able to read or write French, but he would be able to communicate with a French speaking settler mm -hmm. in order to, to conduct his business. And the same thing happens now in, in, if you go to any tourist destination, local people trying to sell their business will try to find out where you're from and they will kind of throw a few words at you Yes. To try and communicate with you, try to establish a connection with you. Yes. I don't think that was very different back then. Absolutely. And I just wonder whether or not the orality of all of this actually um, enhances the communication pathway between the two, the two um, interlocutors. You know, in other words, that they're not um, affected by a, a written communication so that they actually understand each other, more likely to understand each other better. Well, this also brings a sort of purpose of, of communication I mean, I think very few people would would want to sort of discuss philosophy in a different language. I mean, what means what means multilingualism? How what sort of level qualifies you to be to be multilingual? Uh, Antonella, do you have anything to add? Um, just to add another kind of key word that it was also mentioned before, because we talked about plurilingualism, multilingualism, and we also mentioned. Uh, diglossia that I know is a social linguistic term but I think it's an important one to actually uh, clarify exactly what we are talking about so proficiency in a language um, does not mean first of all necessarily that you are able to write it um, well no proficiency it means so but what I mean is understanding a language does not necessarily mean that you are familiar with all the registers that you should be able to use and that's where you have a situation in which sometimes you have um, kind of a high standard of that language and then you have the low standard um, of uh, the very same language that can generate even more kind of uh, conflict and that is a situation that obviously it's easier to um, to study. I'm not saying that it is easy, but easier to study when you in in the modern context, simply because you can then have kind of uh, more data based on the phonetics, etc. Obviously, this becomes more difficult in our case when we rely mostly on written sources, which I think answer also part of the question that Nerea had. She actually interestingly mentioned um, other type of sources. What when we start looking at um, archaeology, etc. Um, and I think. It is an interesting uh, point, it is an interesting debate that leads us also to the kind of very philosophical question of um, should we in the first place actually when we think about language think about orality as completely separate from the written word which is a bit also of a, um, a complicated one um, but at the same time how instead can we use the written record to somehow shed some light on the kind of multiple dimension, including the oral dimension of that language. Well, in some cases, if you're lucky enough to have a king who was so good to write his own autobiography, you have glimpses of that, but it doesn't happen that often. Yeah. I, I, just wanna... I mean, what you just mentioned, Antonella, of course, you know, there's this famous quotation of historical linguist uh, Labov, who said that, you know, historical linguist is making the best of bad data. Uh, exactly. <laughs> Jan, you wanted to say something? No, just very quickly to add on the, the idea of diglossia is that sort of in, in at least the context I've been looking at is mostly in religious kind of context. So you'd have, you can very well imagine people are able to um, uh, recite a Latin prayer or recite the Quran in Arabic, but it doesn't mean that they, that they are fluent or proficient in that language. It's a language of scripture. Um, and on that note, I think it's, it's, Interesting to note that that although you're right, it's it's a it's very much an oral culture in the Middle Ages and much more than we are used to today. There's far less scripture, uh, far less writing go around. Um, but, but there is the example uh, that that I've been using in my research of of Lateran IV, where uh, Pope Innocent III 
organized this huge church council and tried to kind of um, impose some ways in, in improving the way the church was working, at least the Catholic church. And one of the decrees, uh, kind of nine, talks about specifically how uh, the problem of having uh, different languages in the different di in the different bishoprics, the different dioceses, and how bishops are responsible to appoint priests who can administer to the people in their own language, which implies that if they say that, it implies that they had difficulties in finding one person who could administer properly in different vernaculars, which means that even on, on the level of the clergy, they needed to find people to talk to the people in their own language, in their own vernacular, leaving aside the scriptural language. And we have the impression that everything was in Latin back then in terms of religion, at least in Western Europe. But, but that, that wasn't the case. It's what is preserved now. Yeah, we have but now is the... when you when you look at the text, I mean, some texts look Latin, like um, Roger Wright has worked on this. Texts that are supposedly lit written in Latin, but he has actually shown that the underlying text that was read out would have been Portuguese. Mm. Would have yeah, exactly. been a text which sounds like funny Latin, but actually what they read out was the port what to put was the yeah. Portuguese. So you have this difference between the language in which a, a text is supposedly composed. Yeah text that's actually being delivered orally so and it, it has it has skewed i think our view on on the middle ages much to to have only the sources preserved that were written in the language that was used for writing down stuff mm. yeah. we have it's a very big kind of gray zone when thinking about oral culture and multilingualism i think yeah well i mean again sort of the work I do is so different because I work on a minority community and in the minority community you actually have completely in the Jewish community you have completely different literacy uh, you know the literacy is estimated at 90 90 95% of oh, yeah that's what I said Western of Jewish males Western so again there's a very different uh, you can see how the different communities sort of performed very very differently in a different context because of, of their literacy mm -hmm. I have another question from Esther Dorado hang on where is it with regard to Antonella's comments on the Book of Deeds, if I remember correctly, Joan the First often uses Castilian to report the words of Castilian-speaking people, but very rarely does it with Arabic, just for war cries and such. I wonder if that's because his Arabic is not good enough or because his scribes weren't able to write it, and maybe he thought his audience wouldn't understand Arabic or all of the above. Does Antonella have any comments on that? Um, thank you, Esther, for the question. I think we go back to uh, the question of why is he writing these and for whom is he writing these? And although this chronicle autobiography will and would become, and it has become, one of the key kind of uh, works of historiography for the later named Crown of Aragon, I think it, it was actually conceived as a, as a work, as a um, kind of a didactic text for, for his successors. Hence the use of uh, Catalan rather than Aragonese because uh, otherwise, uh, you know, you, you want to make, make sure that actually more people can um, read that. Um, and you're absolutely right. There's a very interesting uh, switch with the Castilian, not just to, actually interestingly enough, not just to report uh, whatever the King of Castile might have said, but there are parts where he, there are just words in Castilian that are kind of it seems kind of forgotten there, um, and you're absolutely right. There's not the same thing with the Arabic, and I think partially it is, it might be because it becomes also very uh, difficult to um, translate phonetically um, on the one hand, but possibly um, exactly for the reason that we said. He wants to make sure that this is understood by his successors primarily and then obviously later on with the different um, and later um, translations that obviously changes completely. By the way, this is also very interesting when we look at the manuscript itself that's quite interesting because although now scholars agree that the original must have been dictated in uh, Catalan. The actual L kind of oldest surviving manuscript that we have is in Latin, it's from 1313. Um, a copy a version that was translated, completely re-edited, I would say 
in law register messed up by the Dominican friar Pere Marsili, who did uh, quite a bit of refurbishing around. Um, but I think that uh, partially um, is questioning what what was this aimed at and or actually who uh, was supposed to read uh, or, or listen to this uh, chronicle autobiography and hence going back to the languages that appear that. So that, that's my view, at least. Chris, do you have anything to add? Well, I, I, I'd love to have something to add, um, but I, I think, uh, I mean, the, the landscape uh, um, and the period in which I work, um, there, there's, there's doubts about who is speaking what. So um, that sort of pointed use of particular language X at one point and language Y at another in a, in a text um, rarely, rarely occurs, certainly in Paul the Deacon. Um, he, he has interlocutors, obviously, that do not speak um, vulgar Latin, um, but he does not um, provide any indication of what they were speaking. Um, and in fact, um, so far as the Avars are concerned, um, nobody really knows what they might or might not have been speaking uh, for certain in any case. So it's all rather uncertain, which is quite exciting because it suggests that there isn't necessarily um, a connection between language community, political community, and as Jan was saying earlier, religious community. So you could potentially have some competence, not, not necessarily a fluent competence, but a competence in, in different languages for different elements of what your life um, mean, need, needs to do. So far as the, the political entity of the Avar is concerned, there are communities that possibly spoke in some form of Germanic, there are communities that spoke some form of um, romance, and there are communities that might have spoken some sort of Slavic. So if you're the elite group that's trying to control all of those, there has to be some sort of means of control that will allow you to do it. Um, but you don't know what it is. So um, it, it's rather all, uh, all rather uncertain, I think. We have a comment from, from Maria João Branco. She says, is, is it not the case that orality and reading and writing are totally interdependent? Would they need to be fluent to be functional? Purchases and contracts were always publicized, i.e. read aloud, uh, and this is true for everyone. Reading documents in Latin in a way that uh, the people hearing could understand was rather standard, wasn't it? And then we have another question from Panagiotis uh, Ant 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 Antonopoulos. Two questions for Jan. First, assuming the Franks stayed for a long, the longer period in the Middle East, would you anticipate the formation of a lingua franca just as it happened on Frankish Greece by the 14th century? And the second question is, I wonder if we perhaps underestimate the contribution of the Normans of Southern Italy in forming an easier means of general contacts within the Crusader states by the introduction of their cosmopolitan attitude. So that's very loaded. Anything you um, want to do from this, Jan? Um, yeah, the first question is, is interesting and it's that kind of typical, you know, what if kind of history question. Um, I, don't, I don't think so, to be fair, because what research has shown, um, for instance, the research by the late uh, David Jacobi, that um, the, the kind of, the, the different groups of Europeans settled in the the, the the east in the in in Palestine and Syria, even though they were less kind of fenced off from their environment as previous scholars have have thought, they still had in a kind of social, political, legal, and religious sense, they were still very much kind of islands within that society. So. And if you think about it, they, they were there for two centuries. Some of these people were born there and died there and had several generations of, of them growing up surrounded by Arabic speaking people. So they had, they really had the means over two centuries to, to, to adopt a, if you will, lingua franca that incorporated also Eastern languages, but they didn't. And I think it's because in a very early instance, they, they kind of, made a very feudal imported society model into the east and they didn't need to communicate much with the other people aside from trade via interpreters or middlemen and so on um, so i don't think that even if they had stayed longer than 1291 that they would have developed more of an interaction with the arabic i don't think that's that's the case um, not that they didn't want to but it's because they didn't need to um, I think the second question is a, is a, as Miriam said, a loaded one. 
in a way that I know I'm not a Norman uh, or you know, Southern Italian Norman specialist, but the story of the cosmopolitanism of the Normans is, is sort of has been, you know, taken down a bit by scholars recently, as in, yes, they were um, people like uh, Norman of Sicily, King Norman uh, of Sicily, they were accepting towards their Arabic subjects, their Muslim subjects, but it doesn't make them cosmopolitan. Um, there are very there are a lot of instances that show that they were also they were cosmopolitan only in their pragmatic approach to having these people within under their rule. Um, they were not very cosmopolitan towards the Greeks, for example. They were not very cosmopolitan towards well. There, there's there's various instances where the Normans were trying to kind of get rid of the um, Muslim population as well. So, mm. so yes, the Norman, Norman society in, in Sicily at least was, was to an extent cosmopolitan, but I, I, I think the word is a bit, um, may not be the correct word to use there. I think they were, like in Britain, the Normans um, did the same thing. They, they took over a society by replacing sort of the highest levels and and um, taking power that way. Same thing happened in the south of Italy and, and Normandy. Um, I think you'd need a lot more actual Normans there on every level of society to call it a cosmopolitan society, if that makes sense. All right, I'm afraid we'll have to sort of wrap up here because we've, we've reached the end of our, our time. Um, the, Webinar audience is invited to stay on a bit longer. I think we'll, we'll chat for another 10 minutes, but we're saying goodbye to our Facebook audience now. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. It was a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, thank you to our panelists as well, who, who, who gave the most illuminating talks. And um, I hope you watch the space. Um, watch out for future um, uh, uh, joint wolf a Society for the Medieval Mediterranean uh, seminar uh, webinars, and also do check out our Mazak, do check out our uh, our uh, memberships. Antonella, as president of the society, do you have anything to add? Would you like to say a, a final word? Should I do what I plan to do since the beginning? Very good. We welcome, we welcome members, and we look forward to seeing you all, hopefully in person, at the next conference.